the big cat people are backstabbing pieces of shit. A decades-long feud comes to a bizarre end. Tiger King stands accused of trying to have a woman killed. Not you know, there's not every day that a zookeeper went to prison for murder for hire. Hello, folks, and welcome to the Tiger Crisis Podcast. Uh, my name is Dan Frigolat. I'm going to start this whole thing off by letting you know right out of the gate that I'm a stand-up comedian, and uh, what is being said on this podcast is wildly speculative and specifically for entertainment purposes. Uh, feel free to fact check us. Feel free to tell us we're wrong. Feel free to challenge us. We're open for all that stuff. Uh, mostly we're just here to have a good time and talk about some of the most ridiculous things that we've seen on the internet involving tigers and tiger ownership. Uh, a lot of you need to understand that there is this incredible, incredible documentary out right now called Tiger King. Uh, it's on Netflix. Uh, it's a wonderful series. I think it's eight or nine episodes uh, already. My fact checking is 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 coming into play, and uh, it's changing everyone's life. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, so far uh, we're in the middle of a quarantine here in uh, somewhere in New York, New Jersey area, and we've been watching this thing nonstop for days, and it's fresh in our minds. We wanted to talk about it. So the Tiger Crisis podcast uh, is is largely centered around the fact that every four or five years, someone comes out with a documentary about tiger ownership and kind of in the same way that every like dog movie ends the same way, um, every tiger story sort of ends with someone getting killed, uh, usually by the tiger. Uh, so we'll get into that as much as we can. But um, right out of the gate, Tiger King, uh, I think it's called Murder, Mayhem, and Madness, I think is what they what they taglined the show on Netflix. Um, it's largely centered around these three characters. Um, it's It's... This guy that calls himself Joe Exotic, who runs a, a, th a thing called the uh, the, w the GW Zoo in Oklahoma. Uh, there's this woman called Carol Baskin, who uh, owns Big Cat Rescue in Florida, and there's a gentleman named Doc Antle who thinks he's better than all of the th all of the people involved, and he runs a place called Myrtle Beach Safari in South Carolina, as you could imagine. Um, What's incredible about the whole thing is the ego on anybody who owns a tiger. There's something about this thing. I think, like, what's weird is the same type of people that want to own guns, it seems, are the same, are the people that want to own tigers. That's what I find super interesting is uh, once you own a tiger, you sort of only have the need to have a gun now to protect yourself against the tiger. That's what, that's what I find super interesting. So here's what's fun. Um, over the course of four years, this documentary crew sits down with Joe Exotic and his, uh, like arch nemeses over multiples of interviews. And because the amount that these people like to be in the spotlight, they completely change their behavior and become very agitated towards one another and trying to become the biggest and most important cat owner, big cat owner, as they like to call themselves. And each of them is trying to shut the other one down. And because of all of those things, uh, we end up with these crazy circumstances that all boil down to some wild, wild activities that I think wouldn't have happened if the cameras weren't on. So four years changes these three people and the entire crew and everybody else's lives forever. Uh, it literally is a story of pedophilia, incest, murder, suicide, coercion, orgies, presidential runs, legislation, lobbying, lawsuits, theft, polygamy, lions, tigers, bears, collusion, homophobia, expired meat, guns, philandering, and divorce. And the one thing that I think is the takeaway from this entire documentary is pretty much 
if you own a tiger, people will find you sexually attractive, which I think I think is wild. I think that's a wild thing. Uh, I think we're all trying to be uh, sexy and 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 sexual out here. And if I knew all I needed to do was get a tiger, my entire life would have been set up completely different. Let's just say that. So it's a weird, weird type of experience watching this thing. And each each episode is like focusing on a different aspect of these people's lives. And every time you watch one of these episodes, what's going on in each of the... This, this doesn't make sense. Like the, the types of behavior that's going down doesn't make any sense. So episode one, we go down the line and we meet all these people. We meet Doc Antle, who, by the way, is not a doctor, has just given himself a, a title of doctor uh, so that he could have this fun nickname. Joe Exotic, who is to best be described as a gay hillbilly uh I, I i don't have a better way to to say it and I, and I don't and i honestly don't mean either of those words to be demeaning I, I don't i don't i don't identify him in a in a negative way because of either of those things i identify him in a negative way because of his behavior now what's interesting is we find out episode one of the or excuse me of the the documentary that joe exotic eventually is on trial for a murder for hire plot against Carol Baskin. We we learned that right out of the gate. I'm not I'm not spoiling anything for you. We learned this before we learn anything else about uh, any of the experiences that that Joe Exotic ends up on trial for a murder for hire plot against Carol Baskin before we know who these people are. Uh, and then we slowly start being introduced to these people and their experiences. And the, the documentary largely centers around this guy, Joe Exotic, this, this gay hillbilly gentleman, and his antics. Uh, at some points in the documentary, he claims to have 135 cats, big cats that he lives with. And, I mean, the guy, in the course of his career, in figuring out that it's sexy and fun to own tigers and, and create his own zoo, he figures out that he needs to, like, make money by presenting these animals. So it's like, first step was him going to, like, elementary schools with tigers and doing shows in front of the children on the stage that they had there. Uh, now, I saw a lot of performances in my high school. None of them had anything to do with tigers. Um, so somewhere along the line in that process, he decides that uh, tigers aren't enough and that he should also be doing magic. So then he's doing a magical tiger act with rabbits and tigers and all this other crazy stuff. Um, and then eventually he starts working... At malls, he'd bring tigers to malls and do displays with the tigers. Uh, basically, this guy ends up running his own zoo, his own private zoo somewhere in Oklahoma. Which, if you look at a map, it's actually it's actually one of the wildest places to be because he's touching by one state. He's touching like let's let's call it forty uh, percent of the country. If you go, if you extrapolate two states from Oklahoma in any direction. You pretty much have the entire country. The only thing you're skipping is sort of the Carolinas, everything that happens north of that, uh, Florida, California, Oregon, and uh, uh, Washington. Everything else in our country is basically two states away from Oklahoma. So this guy is just banking on the fact that he is a private zoo with tigers uh, in the middle of the country. And people love it. The, the, the whole first episode, we're watching people come to his zoo and he's saying fun stuff he's like look uh this is the closest you'll be to a dangerous cat anywhere else in the country um if you get peed on by one of our cats we have uh, i got peed on by a tiger uh t-shirts in the gift shop make sure to check those out i mean the guy is just uh, an absolute maniac who uh just here's the thing I think once you decide that you can own a tiger and there's very little that people can do to stop you, you realize that you're kind of untouchable. It's like there's no uh, there's no security system better than 135 tigers. That's just a fact. So we meet Joe. 
this this maniacal character who largely is in this business to be cool and to be sexy. It's kind of what he's going for. And then we meet Doc Antle, who uh, dresses in all safari gear. Think of uh, like a, uh, what's the guy's name? Like a crocodile hunter kind of character. Or like a um, like a Jack Hanna kind of character, ex- except if he didn't go to school. Like if, think of Jack Hanna if he uh, thought that like, LARPing was cool. Like, think of a guy who plays Dungeons and Dragons and does magic on the side and grew his hair long and has that little thing, that little, you know, that little, they call it like the flavor saver, the little uh, piece of uh, uh, like beard that's below your lip but isn't a beard. Like, that's the only piece of beard that he keeps. Two earrings, like, like he looks like a pirate uh, or someone trying to Im- like impersonate a pirate who also then likes to eat. Like, that's pretty much what Dog Antle looks like. And he, throughout the whole thing, is claiming he's the guy. He's the one who knows about these animals, who's handling them properly. Everybody else is, is shenanigans, and this he's the guy. He's the pro, and he's the one who you need to be uh, in line with because he's doing everything right, and he's treating the animals right. Everyone else must be treating the animals wrong. Then we meet Carol Baskin who is a little bit eccentric. We go through in the first episode her house. Everything in her house is uh, is cheetah print, cheetah or tiger or leopard print. And it's just like this whole big fun thing where she's like, well, look, I can't lose my luggage at the airport because it's all cheetah print. I'm the only one who has cheetah print. All this, all this shenanigans. Um, one of my favorite pickup lines in the entire first episode is when we meet Carol Baskin who also, at, in this point in time, when we meet her, has 85 to 100 cats. And her scheme is that she is the rescue lady. She's not, uh, she's not necessarily staging her scenario like she owns a zoo. Her entire experience is based around she's, she's rescuing cats from private owners who should not have had them in the first place. So that's her swing. But meanwhile, she is that. She is a person who owns private cats, whether she, I don't know what she, like, we don't ever really get an understanding of how Carol gets these cats. We just know that she's quote unquote rescuing them. And maybe she's repossessing cats that like just become problems for other people because there are very, very few regulations. We also find out throughout this, uh, this documentary series that Carol is the one who's trying to get laws passed. So that's how we meet everybody, and we think that that's what their, their deal is. Oh, the point that I was trying to make was that Carol, as we're going through her house, we find out that she is allergic to cats. Uh, that is one of the main things that I took from episode one is that this lady whose business is called Big Cat Rescue uh, who, as we come to find out, makes $20,000 in fundraising campaigns like every week um, on Facebook. She's on Facebook claiming that she's the person who's rescuing tigers and everybody loves tigers. And so people are donating twenty to $30,000 a month to help her with this endeavor. Meanwhile, she is allergic to cats. I think that's the craziest thing um, in the first episode that we're, that we're dealing with. And again, this is this is on the heels of knowing that there is incest, murder, suicide, all of these things involved. Um, so it's a wild ride of of a, of a documentary, and I and I and I highly recommend that you check it out. Right now, we're in one of the wildest times on Earth with uh, the coronavirus happening. Uh, Globally, it's the uh, first day of the podcast is uh, April 1st. This is our first recording day. And uh, well into the midnight hours, well into the midnight oil. And um, and basically, we've been in quarantine for what is now, I want to say three full weeks, but but days are starting to blend into to each other, so you're not really sure. So this Tiger King documentary coming out through this process has been a a lifesaver for a lot of people the memes are out of control and um we literally started this podcast on the heels of the documentary just to be able to to comment on the craziness that's involved what we what we do know for sure is that um at the beginning of the documentary this is something like there are more tigers in captivity than um in the wild 
on this planet at this point. And that's a thing that is that is real. And that's a thing that um, that I think this podcast is going to try to highlight over the, the course of time um, and such and so forth. Um, so what I find super interesting is the way a lot of these numbers are compiled. I don't know if people know this or not, but a lot of these numbers about animals across the globe are based on uh, asterisks, right? And like um, like special circumstances and special experiences. So what what I mean to say is, when they say that there are more cats in captivity than there are in the wild, that's very true because, as we know, tigers come from India, which is one of the most populous places on the planet. Now, there are some tigers sort of running around and, like, trying to survive in Bangladesh. That's Bengal tiger. Uh, and in India, and that's in that sort of area in Asia. Uh, but largely, a lot of these animals, lions, tigers... Uh, not necessarily bears, but uh, a lot of these wild cats, cheetahs, are indigenous to, say, Africa, where, again, for the same reasons that we don't want people to be murdered by giant, like, incredible cats, a lot of these animals are in reserves. Um, a common misconception about wild game reserves, which they're, that's what they're called. They're called game reserves because their entire function is to facilitate tourism and uh, hunting, uh, wild animal hunting. Uh, I spent a lot of time in South Africa over the last few years, and what I found is that if I pay X number of dollars, and it's different, literally by animal lion in uh, in africa it's lion cheetah uh, buffalo elephant rhino you can pay different amounts of money and they give you a tag just like here uh if you want to kill a deer you have to buy a tag uh, i'm not exactly sure how that system works but i know how it works in africa which is you buy the tag for that animal and then they let you loose in the park and then you can kill that animal and then bring it to the front and you trade in the tag you say this is the, this is the one tag for one lion um, so I think a common misconception is that these reserves are the same uh, or better than zoos and that they help the population of these animals when the reality is these reserves are specifically designed and and for sure uh, organized around profiting on big five animal hunting experiences. So the only reason I bring up that point is to say that when they say most big cats are in captivity, that also counts all of these places that we're calling reserves that we're claiming in our heads, I think, and a lot of us leave with the information that these, are, these animals are out in the wild living their lives, living their best lives, which is not true. Those are captive animals and... Whatever argument you wanna you wanna give for me on this, a lot of times I hear this one where Kruger Park in um, South Africa is, I think, square mileage wise around the same size as France. So the argument is always that uh, this is it's France. These are these animals are free and they're roaming. Meanwhile. France doesn't have walls. Do you know what I'm saying? Like as much as maybe like a Donald Trump uh, or someone uh, in that realm would want to put walls around every country's border, uh, France doesn't have walls. Kruger Park does have walls, which means these animals are not actually free. There is a bound and bounds to where they can go. And the reality is if I go stand in a corner of a park and I've blocked off, I have a fence and a fence and a fence, now I've cornered an animal, and so this this idea that they're just free and roaming is is a misconception and kind of a, a deliberate like um, piece of misinformation to make us feel better about these experiences. The fact that we are just basically putting these incredible, majestic, wild animals up for 
like on the chopping block, like like in the crosshairs of someone who wants to choose them. And I think the other common kind of misconception is this is this word poacher, because I think a lot of people are like, oh, okay, well, when we were at Cougar Park, they caught a bunch of poachers and this and that and the other thing. A poacher is only a person who tries to kill an animal without having the proper license. You can buy the tag for a pro, for a price. Uh, a good portion of African countries with these game reserves, a good portion of their incoming tourism money that that they get from the country is millions and millions of dollars in allowing people to kill these creatures and they control the population a little bit here and there but largely these animals in other places even the ones that are quote unquote in the wild in Africa in game reserves are captive so that sort of uh, explains a little bit about that 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 notion at the beginning of the documentary that most of these animals are are in captivity because they are they're they're in captivity uh, in all of the ways. Uh, sorry, that was a little bit that got a little boring there, and it was a little bit uh, uh, wordy and in depth on my experience uh, with big cats, and such and so forth. So back to this wild uh, documentary, um, Joe Exotic. Oddly enough, I, again, I don't know how far you've gotten into this thing. Joe Exotic is is a is this like this maniacal character who you oddly start to like to love, and regardless of what your your experience is, regardless of how you feel about um, like somebody who's a hillbilly, and regardless of how you feel about people's sexual orientation, this is a lovable dude. He he really is. Um, He's just he's just happy and he's like about the spotlight and there's something about him that that is endearing. Uh, the other two characters in in the documentary, I I don't feel that way about them. I I don't know why. Even even when even when there's things happening that Joe is doing that seem morally questionable, and there's a lot of that. And even when there's things that Joe is doing that. Uh, like even when he's yelling at people, even when he's like being ridiculous and um, I don't like I said, morally compromised, you, you're still a little bit on his side. He's just like kind of one of these like silly people that that we all know that that, you know, that is just a spotlight person. And they just they they change everything if you put a camera on them. And that's sort of who Joe is. Carol, Carol Baskin. And I'm sure you've seen the memes by now. Uh, there's something about Carol Baskin it seems like she can talk the talk and it seems like she's really good at, at packaging herself. She's very, very careful with every word that she says, but there's something about Carol the entire time that she's being interviewed that you just, at least I did. I got this impression that something's up with this lady and there's something dishonest about her. I, I don't know why that is. Um, and then back to Doc Ansel, this sort of crocodile hunter type character, his, his experience is it's very he's very arrogant a buddy of mine in college uh, had this had this like term for people that he sort of deemed and i think he, i think this is perfect he's like an angry nerd like that's who doc antel is at heart he is an angry nerd and he's very very arrogant and everybody that owns a tiger somehow has to be arrogant and i don't know if it's because they have a 500 pound animal behind them to back up their words or if it is you just have to i don't it's like which came first the arrogance or the tiger that's the big question is do you become a cocky individual because you own a tiger or do you have to be a cocky pos to go and try and purchase a tiger and I don't know the answer and I would love to hear your guys thoughts on this I don't know what the reality is of that of that experience but I do know that Doc seems to be in the same way that Carol is careful with her words there's a lot of times where Doc is like you're not going to catch me on camera saying this about this guy and that just leads us down this path or at least it did for me where I felt like he is a shit talker Pardon my French. Uh, I'm trying to keep this a largely clean podcast, so I do per apologize for the curse. But he talks a lot of smack about a lot of people, but he doesn't want to do it on camera. So he's smart, but he's only smart in the fact that he's not going to show his real self on camera. So he caught himself multiple times. I'm the type of person who, whatever, however I am on or off stage, on or off camera, it's the same guy, right? Like there's no... There's no real separation. The only people that really need to like be careful 
and try to watch their words are people that are that are sort of innately dishonest or innately like trying to swing some kind of other experience. I get it. Look, it's television. It's a reality show. He knows it's a documentary. He knows they're probably going to try to swing him in a lot of different directions. And as someone who's been on shows like this, not this type of show, but I've been on a lot of like uh, in your own words type reality shows where you can tell they're trying to frame you, then the number one rule of thumb is if you didn't say it, uh, then like if you don't say it on camera, then they can't have you saying it. I don't know. That doesn't it sounds idiotic, but a lot of times you'll be like up against the wall. They're doing the interview and they try to put words in your mouth. And a lot of times you just repeat them back or you go into that moment because it feels good to be on camera, all these sorts of things. But pretty much if you don't say it, they can't air it. And I think Doc is pretty good at that. And I've been pretty good at that uh, in a lot of ways. But but it does feel like Doc specifically um, is trying very hard to put his best foot forward. Carol Baskin is very, very smart and I think, I think we catch her in a lot of lies during this experience. Uh, but somehow, she always is in a position where she has some kind of alibi. What's very interesting about Carol, and we'll get way more into this in future episodes, is we find out um, very early on that there's this big shroud around Carol that we think whoever we is, whoever's talking, all of the people that they interview think that she murdered her husband. And then we find sort of out that like there's just a guy who vanished, who had a lot of money. And without this guy vanishing and without her marrying him, uh, a lot of who Carol Baskin is and a lot of what Carol Baskin is allowed to accomplish would not exist. So back to Joe Exotic and his 142 animals that he has. When we first meet Joe... Uh, the, 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 the documentary is well done in the fact that it is very chronological. And so when we first meet Joe, he's very put together and he's very much a showman and he's doing the thing. I mean, just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it better than this. It's like, think of SeaWorld, right? Where they, where you're there and you're seeing the orcas and they're doing the whole thing, except instead of pristine water and beautiful orcas, it's just a hillbilly with a gun on his waist uh, with bleachers and tigers. And he says a lot of things like, oh, my cat is the same as your cat, except for my cat has four-inch fangs and he can murder you in under a second. Uh, he says things like, uh, no, the reason why I have this gun is for people, not for not for tigers. So uh, Joe is a, is, a, is a wild, wild type of person. His, his run through his uh, gift shop is a lot of sort of uh, him showing off the fact that I, I think he's made condoms that either have his face on them or have um, the name of the the, 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 the zoo, GW Zoo, Oklahoma. Uh, I think he has underwear. He's a big thing for him is that like these are the big sellers that everybody wants to have cat print on their on their on their wrapped around their package or whatever his his, you know. His thing is that he says about it. Um, just sort of a shenanigan-y type of dude. Um, but again, as far as I'm concerned, the guy's brilliant. I mean, he understands that having uh, a wild amount of tigers is a big money maker, and it's a, and it's a thing that he uh, and he alone in that area can like capitalize on. We find out in one of the first three episodes that Joe has figured out that in the first, I think it's 12 weeks, 12 or 16 weeks of a baby tiger, of a tiger being born, he can make $100,000 in that first 12 or 16 weeks. So the big thing for Joe has always been breed, 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 breed. Get baby, get baby tigers, get baby tigers, get baby tigers. Uh, get people to the bark, take pictures, take baby tigers to schools, take baby tigers to malls, take baby tigers wherever he can take them. Um, so that's his big money-making scheme. That's his literal uh, pyramid scheme is stack a bunch of tigers in a pyramid and hope that they mate and make more tigers. So it is. What What is funny is each of these... 
zoo type places. We're talking about Oklahoma. We're talking about Florida. We're talking about South Carolina. Just think it's the same kind of like brush stroke that we would paint across those those states for what types of people might be involved in this type of ownership and what type of experience you might you might get out of it. There is no part of any of these zoos that feels in any way professional. They feel like dude in his backyard has a zoo. And I actually found out uh, in in some of the research for this podcast. I know it doesn't sound like it doesn't seem like I've done any research, but I know, but something I found out in a lot of the research in this podcast is there. There's a place like this, like every thirty miles, like there really is. A good friend of mine and an incredible comedian, Nate Bargatze, has multiple jokes about owning tigers, about a place that he went to where the guy uh, had a rep, reptile. I don't know what he called the place, reptile park. Um, and he has uh, multiple stat. He's on Netflix as well. You should check him out. He's got multiple stages in in different uh, uh, stand up specials, checking in on this guy who owns this reptile park. Uh, so I think it was called like a like an alligator terrarium or snake terrarium, something like this. But I grew up in Syracuse, New York, and down the street in Chittenango was the same thing as a guy who owned a private zoo. And the climate of Syracuse, New York, is not really like able to make much like like live a normal life it's it it's like negative degrees in the winter and it snows a hundred inches uh in a very short period of time uh it it's just it's a wild place to try and have animals but meanwhile there's a guy in Chenango who has giraffes and cheetahs, and I think tigers, definitely bears, um, and he just owns them in in like in like a complex that he has in Chenango because it's like sort of sort of one of the more rural places in Syracuse where you can have some land, and it seems like there's not much stopping him. So it seems that there are always documentaries popping up about people that own tigers another documentary that i really really loved uh and an experience that i found was uh there was this one on hbo and i'll find out the name for for the next episode this is a documentary on hbo where there is a a couple that's sort of like a are like a um uh, what are these guys names sigmund and roy sigmund why well, Roy, the two guys who who were the circus performers again. I don't know where my brain is. It's two a.m. at this point, so now I'm just now I'm just uh, coasting. But the the two guys who own who uh, who owned tigers and were circus performers and wore white, and we speculated that they were homosexuals. Uh, they were uh, like sort of these magic performers. Anyway, there was a couple that was sort of this same type of realm, and HBO follows them around a couple years ago, and. It's the same thing. It's it's these it's this couple and they have tigers and they're working in circuses and they're loving these animals and then it becomes this thruple situation and then the end of the documentary is this woman getting eaten by one of the tigers. Which, by the way, if you don't know, that's how these uh, Vegas performers as well died is they got eaten by their own tigers. It's just like that's sort of the eventuality of owning a tiger, just like a, a monkey. I don't know if if you own a monkey, it's going to eventually eat your face. This is this is like a, a statistical fact that an adult monkey at some point is going to attack you and eat your face off your body. Oh, by the way, uh, also, so will your house cat. If you die in front of your house cat, it's going to eat your nose and your ears and the rest of your face five minutes after you die. This is why I'm already weary of... Of cats, but something about this documentary made me fall in love with tigers. Made me fall in love with uh, lions again, um, and they're just the the plethora of information on the internet right now about these animals and about private ownership of them blows my mind. Uh, by the end of this podcast, likely I will buy a tiger. I don't even know why, and then we'll find out if my mood and my and my uh, and my arrogance changes uh, if I become a more arrogant and more uh, uh, self confident person. Uh, once I've decided to buy a tiger. But uh, the reality is uh, Tiger King on Netflix is one of 
the greatest things you should watch. And regardless of your political background, regardless of, of how you feel about animals, regardless of whether you eat meat or you uh, or you're a vegetarian, you're a vegan, all of these things, if you think that the animals are being mistreated. And, and by the way, what's very interesting about this whole thing is, by and large, uh, these animals are pretty well taken care of. There is there is an arc in, in the experience uh, for a lot of these zoos where it kind of seems like Someone who was taking care of animals has started to slip, but by and large, these are well taken care of animals uh, as long as the, the tiger owners continue to have resources. One of my favorite stories, which was sent to me uh, by a dear friend, was um, about a 500-pound ti tiger that lived in a Manhattan apartment in Harlem, and... There's just something about owning a tiger that people love and people will find a way to do it. But what was really interesting and cool about the, the story, and it's a, uh, it's a New York Post article, it's still on the internet, you can find it, is so they have to gather a team to uh, go in and get this tiger. They, they confirm that there's a tiger living in an apartment in Harlem. Uh, the neighbors confirm it. People have been seeing this guy walk a baby tiger around for like a couple years and obviously eventually this baby tiger becomes a full ass grown tiger. So this dude has his tiger, like, on, like, the 35th floor of, like, just a giant, like, I don't know. I think, it, so, a good portion of Harlem, I would say, is these sort of, like, larger, uh, like, like brick housing complexes. And, it's, and it feels like this is sort of the experience where this guy was living, because it was an elevator experience. So, anyway, uh, they get, like, 40 cops two veterinarians they put together a cocktail of uh of of tranquilizers and they have to get a sharpshooter to dangle outside the window of this guy's apartment because they have to trank the tiger arrest the guy uh and then get the tiger the hell out of there and so the story sort of picks up where this this sharpshooter is hanging outside the window, and the vet has has uh, let him know that one of the things that probably will happen with a tiger is it will bum it will it will rush you. Uh, like a tiger's first defensive move is is run at you full speed and try to attack you, and then the second move is hide, run and hide, and then you'll never be able to find it. So basically, the vet is like, you got one shot. To get this tiger. So dude's hanging outside the window. It's New York City. So it's got bars on the windows on the top floor. Because uh, Eric Clapton dropped his son out of a window. And they don't want that to happen again. So they got the safety bars. So you can't drop your kid out the window or your tiger. And the guy pokes the gun through the rifle. Through the, through the spokes of the, 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 the restraints. Uh, sees the tiger. Tiger sees him. Does exactly what the vet says. He pops the tiger once with a trank dart. Then the tiger obviously roars, doesn't really appreciate getting hit with the thing, realizes where it's coming from, squares up to the window, runs full speed at the window, and butts it with his head, breaking the window and hitting the restraints, the child restraints. As this is happening, the sharpshooter, all he's thinking is, I hope that this tiger doesn't fall out the window not die, and then just be a tiger running loose in Harlem, killing, like, whoever, like, his cop friends, and just chill, just whoever's around. Like, that's his main fear. So, as advertised, tiger, pow, hits the window, cracks the window, uh, doesn't break through the window. Then it goes and hides. They come back. They sort of like make sure what's going on. They can't. They can't see him through the window. So then they they wait the sort of whatever twenty minutes, whatever's supposed to do. Then they come back in. They trank him again, uh, and then they like come in the front door, see him, trank him again, and then have to get like I think I think they said it took like eight or nine dudes to lift this creature onto like a gurney, and get him out of the building. Now, this is my favorite part of the whole article, New York Times article. You can check it out. Um, at the end of the article, the cop is kind of like. 
advocating owning a tiger. Like the sharpshooter cop sort of tells us how majestic and incredible this animal was and how incredible his experience was being near it. He was like, oh, it's on the gurney and it's there. And I just had to touch it. Like that's what's wild is the end of every one of these stories. And this is another thing that happens in the Tiger King documentary is there's a lot of people that work for these guys, Carol and Doc and, and Joe. There's a lot of people that work for these. And, and, and arguably you could say that they are underpaid and and sort of mistreated in a lot of ways. There's not a lot of benefits. A lot of them live on premise. A lot of them live in like uh, like like horrible conditions. No bathrooms. No air conditioning. Just horrible scenarios. And every time these people get interviewed, and they're like, "Look, why were you in this thing? It kind of feels like you were in a cult. Like, what was the thing? Why weren't you being paid?" And every single time, they're like, "Look, I don't. I didn't know if I was ever going to get to work, work with tigers again." That's how fucking. Beautiful, and I apologize for swearing. That's how beautiful it is to own a tiger, to even be around a tiger. Is that you could trank a tiger, think that it's going to kill all of your family members, like like that are that like all of your coworkers. Sorry, all of like all of Manhattan, maybe you, um, and you're still like, you know what? I can't be mad at this tiger. It's gorgeous. Tigers are gorgeous, guys. Tigers are in crisis. Uh, all all of the the population of tigers, or the vast majority of population of tigers, are in captivity. Uh, so this is Tiger Crisis Episode One. I hope you guys enjoy what we heard. Um, please send us your comments. Send us your questions. We're gonna uh, figure out the format and the complexity of this podcast as we go. But we wanted to get Episode One in the can and uh, get it out there for you guys and see what you think see if uh if we're, we're talking about things that you appreciate uh i try to keep a lot of the spoiler alerts off it as we move into episode two three four five and six and seven of the pod or excuse me of the documentary uh we're gonna get deeper and deeper into some of these chats uh about what's going on and what happens and uh i will try to stay way more informed i apologize uh and we'll see what we can do. We'll see if we can crack this case about what happens about tiger ownership on Earth. And uh, maybe as a team, we can all just start a Patreon to just get a tiger. Maybe that, I mean, that'll be a great end to the podcast is if uh, we do 10 episodes and I just own a tiger at the end. I will be the greatest tiger father, I promise. Guys, this is Tiger Crisis. My name is Dan Frigolette. Again, this is a podcast largely made for entertainment purposes. Uh, probably a lot of what I said was speculative. Probably a lot of what I said was false. Um, but we're just here to have fun. We're here to entertain you during this uh, coronavirus crisis. I do want to say very sincerely, please, 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 please stay at home. Uh, I know there's a lot of silliness now and a lot of people have a lot of opinions about what's going on and whether or not it's as serious as they say it is. Uh, let's take everybody's word for it now. Let's even look at uh, some of the people that had an experience where they were saying that it wasn't going to be large. Those people have 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 recanted their own opinions. Uh, the president included a lot of people that said, listen, we, let's, let's, let's shelter in place for two weeks. It's turning into a month. Uh, Maryland and Virginia have turned it into June 10th, which will be an unprecedented, um, what is that, three months of sheltering in place. Uh, a lot of us understand the severity of what's going on. And even just in the last, let's say, seven days, the stats from April 25th to, excuse me, March 25th to March 31st, the number of deaths of COVID-19 have doubled. So that's the problem, the exponential growth. Uh, so please stay at home. Please be safe. Please watch Tiger King. Uh, listen to this podcast.